Go ahead and turn in your Bibles, Luke chapter 18, that's where our lesson will be from, and we will get going in our study of God's Word. As we go through this passage today, what we're going to study is how Jesus loves the little children, how the Lord loves kids. Now, sometimes we forget how difficult it can be to have kids. I remember many years ago, uh, back when my kids were just babies, coming to church and having about two or three hours of sleep because their sleep schedules were very, very different than mine back at that time. And I remember keeping the kids uh, in the pew during the sermon. Back then, I used to pray for the short sermons. Not so much anymore. But I remember sitting there, you know, just waiting. And every time one of the kids would open his mouth, in would go a smarty. Later, we matured to goldfish. And I would just pray for just to make it through the sermon once. Because as soon as the baby cried, every eye in the auditorium would turn right to you. And if you feel that way, or if that happens to you nowadays, God bless you, and God is proud that you're here. A few years later, my kids got a little bit older. We went from crawling to toddling to running a million miles an hour. And I know every once in a while, my kids would get away, and we would fly up to the pulpit and grab a microphone, or we would run here, run there, and my shoulders would slump, because that meant next week... We'd get an elder's announcement about how everybody had to watch their kids. Now, don't let your kids run in church because we have a lot of older members, a lot of middle-aged members like me, and we can get run over and you can hurt people. But it was hard keeping up with those kids. I remember a few years later when it was time for youth group stuff. You have to go up on weird times on Saturdays and Fridays and get your kids Sometimes you have to wait late Sunday night, and it's too far to go home, but it's too close to sit there at the building, so you just have to figure out something. And it's hard sometimes on Sunday nights and Wednesday nights and for youth trips to make sure that your kids have an opportunity to be with the youth group, an opportunity to do the things which they can do, which help them to grow. If you're going through any of those sort of things, God bless you. The Lord appreciates the work that you're going through. Because as you and I read through this passage today, we see the importance that God places upon children. Now, if you are looking at cross text, that is a parallel text throughout Scripture, you're going to see the same passage in Matthew chapter 19, and you're going to also see it in Mark chapter 13. And what's going on as you and I are reading this in Matthew, Mark, and Luke is Jesus is having a pretty adult conversation. It's time for us to head to Jerusalem. In a few weeks, he's going to the crucifixion. He is going through some very deep subjects. In Mark and Matthew, he's talking about marriage, divorce, and remarriage. Also, he's talking about the second coming. In the book of Luke, he's going through these parable discourses or a series of parables because we're trying to make sure that sinners know that they're welcome in the gates of heaven and that the Pharisees and scribes know that they need to change to get to the gates of heaven. Pretty adult subjects. And so what we see in the middle of all this adult time, and oftentimes our church services are designed for somebody about 50 to 55 years old, In the middle of this adult time, you have children who are interrupting the service. You have children who are coming in and changing the subject right when these adults want to hear what the rabbi has to teach. It's kind of an interruption, if you will. And yet in the midst of this, Jesus lets us know how much children matter to him. I want us to look at some quotes, Uh, some quotes that I've put together. Uh, Dr. Seuss said, a person's a person no matter how small. Frederick Douglass Douglass tells us it's easier to build strong children (coughs) than to repair broken men. Um, You go a little bit later, Hiram Gino, uh, he says children are like wet cement. Whatever falls on them makes an impression. Uh, Fyodor Dostoevsky is a Russian novelist, says the soul is healed most quickly when you're in the presence of children. Irma Bombeck says children are what really makes your life important. Herbert Hoover, 31st president of the U.S., said children are our most valuable resource. A select panel put together in Congress for promotion of child health in 1981 said children may be one-third of our population, but they're 100% of our future. A couple of ones I think are a little bit more funny. 
(laughs) Children seldom will misquote you. As a matter of fact, they usually repeat word for word everything you should never say. Uh, Fred Rogers says, anyone who does anything to help a child is a hero to me. Uh, Another one is, children are a great comfort to us in our old age. The only problem is they get us there a lot quicker than we wanted to. A characteristic of the most normal child is that he never acts that way. I like that one, too. And Orlando Batista, he is a chemist from Canada, says the best inheritance a parent can give his children is a few minutes of his time each and every day. Of course, Nelson Mandela says there's no keener revelation of a society's soul than the way in which it treats its children. And I think we could change that quote from society to church. One of the best ways to measure a church and whether a church is like Jesus is the way it treats its young people, the way there's an emphasis upon children. And that's something that every one of us have to remember, just how important our kids are and that they really, really matter. So let's begin to look at this passage and see what this passage has to say to us today. As we look at verse 15, in verse 15, I want us to notice that Jesus blesses the presence of children in his church. If you have children with you today, he is proud of you for bringing those kids here. And every child which we have, oftentimes there's a little bit of background noise in church. That's one of the most beautiful sounds that God hears is the sound of children who are crying, children who are cooing, uh, kids who are just learning their very first words, and they're beginning to share with every one of us. What you see there in verse 15, as you see those children being brought, that word brought means prephos. It means gently leading a child or directing or guiding a child in a certain direction. And what's neat here is we have parents who have an opportunity in verse 15 that no one else had either before then or after then. They have an opportunity to bring their children to Jesus. And so whenever they had that opportunity, they brought their children. They gently led them, they guided them to make sure that they were there. And as you and I read through the Gospels, we see that every time Jesus heard about a child being sick, he stopped what he was doing and he took care of that child. Whenever Jesus saw a child, oftentimes in Scripture we see he stopped, stopped whatever he was doing, and made sure that he touched, that he blessed, that he was with that child. And he wants to transmit to us or teach to us today the absolute importance of children. Now, as you begin looking in the text more closely, you see that word for infant. uh, That's what the New King James says here in Luke chapter 18. That word is a brephos. It means an infant, a baby being brought to Jesus. It's also the word that's used over in the book of Mark. Now, in the book of Luke, it's a little bit different. That word is padion, P-A-D-I-O-N. That's a toddler. It's a young, young person, probably preschool age. And so these are very young children being brought to Jesus. Now, culturally, this was a very unusual thing to happen. Rabbis very rarely in the first century world spent a lot of time with children. Now, if you had a male heir, that was important. It was important to have a male heir in which your inheritance could move through. But very rarely in the first century world did people spend a lot of time with infants or with toddlers. Part of that was because of infant mortality. A good percentage, not the majority, but a good percentage of children which you had at that age in the first century world weren't going to make it. And so very rarely would people spend time attaching themselves to some of these children. Now that sounds cold and cruel-hearted to us because it is, but it was a matter of fact of life in that day. Another part of it was in the culture of that day, people respected old age. They expected, respected uh, the wisdom from the elders. And so very little attention was given to children. Now if you're from a generation or two or three ago, You oftentimes would hear the saying, children are better seen and not heard. You ever hear that? That was what was said many, many years ago. And a little bit of that was from the first century. So people would say, don't bother the rabbi. Don't bother the church with your children. Make sure that they're seen but not heard. But Jesus is very different. Jesus has a very different opinion of children. We read in Psalm 127, 3 through 5, where David himself would write this. 
Children are an inheritance from the Lord. Like a quiver which is ready for your bow, blessed is a man who has many, many of them. And so you see in that passage the importance of children, the importance of children not just having them, but the importance of having children present who are there. Now, the Bible tells us quite a bit about why children need to be impressed upon, and that's because this is the age, when we think about presence of children, this is the age where you get a lot of good impressions upon your child as he grows up. In Moses' very last sermon, the book of Deuteronomy, notice one of the ways in which he begins it. In the beginning of the book, Deuteronomy chapter 6, he says, take every opportunity you have to teach your children, whether they're standing up, whether they're lying down, whether they're going out, whether they're coming in, tell them the word of God. Teach them that God loves them, that God wants them, that God wants to be with them for eternity. He said, when you go around the house, decorate your house with memory verses so they'll always have these things impressed upon their mind. When they go out, always keep in front of them, before their eyes, the word of God, because when you raise a child, you need to raise them in the Lord because that's when you make the impression. The book of Proverbs tells us, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. And so many denominational and religious groups teach very similar things. They tell us that if they can inoculate a child and teach a child before the age of 12, that that child most likely will not leave that faith. If they can impress upon a child a habit, a doctrine, usually that child, as he grows older, even when he has rational thinking, will tend to stay in the spot in which he's learned. Marxists have said the same thing. Those from the Soviet Union and those from Cuba have also emphasized the training of young children because they see how impressionable those kids are at that age. Now, I have a couple of bachelor's degrees and master's degrees and other degrees such as that. And so, you know, I've studied a little bit of Greek, a little bit of Hebrew, a little bit of all that different stuff. But oftentimes in my preaching, in my teaching, I tend to pull more from the Bible classes where I grew up than I do from some of that collegiate level education. I remember the Pearl Garvins and the other ladies who would teach me in second grade. Uh, Back then we had flannel boards and they would all be so creative in teaching us about the parting of the Red Sea and teaching us about Jesus walking on the water and teaching us about the resurrection and about the birth of Jesus. And many times as I'm reading through Scripture, I remember the work of these sweet ladies that they, they gave to me. And so it's important that we take our Bible classes seriously. It's important that we appreciate the children who are here and the effort that goes into raising those children up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Now as you go to verse 16... You see not only the importance of the presence, having them here, but you also see the importance of the potential of children. A parallel passage would be in Matthew 19, 14, where Jesus says, Let the children come to me. Do not forget, forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of God. Now, when you read in this passage, that word rebuke is a very strong word. And Jesus did not get angry very often. He got upset sometimes when people did not operate the temple in which they should, when people were trying to make money off of God's word in an improper way. He got angry at Peter when Peter stood before him and said, you're not going to the cross. I love you too much to let yourself be put to death. He said, get behind me, Satan. But as a matter of fact, Jesus very rarely got angry. But what we see here is he rebuked people. When people keep Jesus away from children, that makes him angry. Over in the book of Matthew, Jesus says something which is fairly offensive. He says, it would be better for you to tie a heavy stone around your neck and to be tossed into the sea than for you to cause one of these young ones to stumble. Now, that's pretty fierce. Jesus is saying, I would rather you just go be dead rather than you put yourself in that position. What's Jesus talking about? The emphasis that comes with children and with young people. 
Jesus wants to make sure that none of us gets in the way of young people coming to heaven. Now, our children in a safe state. There are some denominational people which teach a doctrine of hereditary depravity. That is, they think that a, a child is born in sin, and until they're enlightened by the Holy Spirit, they cannot be saved. That's not what the Bible teaches. In Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 20, and in that passage, we see that each one of us is responsible for our own actions and for our own sins. The father is not responsible for the sins of the son, nor is the sin responsible or the son responsible for the sins of the father, but every one of us will answer for ourselves. We read in 2 Samuel chapter 12 an interesting passage which David says. David has a young baby who is dying and withering away, much of it because of his own sin, because of David's sin. And when that child dies, David makes a statement. That child shall never return to me, but instead I'm going to go to him. I want you to look at an overview of David's life. When that happened, David changed his attitude. You don't see the family problems which happened earlier with Absalom and Amnon and others. You don't see him cheating like he did with Bathsheba. David changed his character. He became a very different person because he desired to spend eternity with the child which he lost. He did that because he knew the eternal destiny of his child. Each one of us knows that God is here for our children. In Psalm 139, 13 through 16, David writes this, Before I was born, you knew me. As you formed my inward parts, you knew everything about me, and you saw the preciousness of me. And as you and I read through that passage, we see not only that the child in the womb is a person and needs to be treated as such, we see that child is loved. You love your children. It's a natural thing. Let me tell you something. God loves your children before you loved your children. And God loves your children even more than you love your children. No one loves your children more than God does. As he formed them within your body, he knew their specialness and their importance. And yet we live in a dangerous world today. There are many physical dangers. We've probably read online and other places about child trafficking which seems to be so prevalent in our culture and society today. And how there are terrible people who abuse children. And even in our own city and county, we see rates of abuse that are so high and children who see and experience things which they never should be around. It's a dangerous world to live in. We see it's a dangerous world socially. As kids are on social media and sometimes they mistreat one another, as such terrible things happen in this world. And it's so hard as parents to protect, to be there for your kids because this world is so different than the world in which we grew up in. It's a difficult, dangerous world for our children spiritually. As there are so many things in this world competing for our kids' heart, so many things which are attacking us, So many things which are trying to pull our kids away from God and away from morality and things that are important to God and to us. It's a dangerous, dangerous world. And yet the Lord sees that each child matters. And he sees the potential of every single one of us. I used to play oftentimes when I preached at churches which would have a lot of children And I would talk about how this girl would grow up and be president, and this boy (coughs) would grow up and become a doctor and save, you know, many, many people with some of the inventions and the work in which he did. I used to encourage the uh, baby boys, you know, grow up and be preachers, grow up and be youth ministers. And as we'd talk about that thing and think about potential which is there, it's amazing to see the potential of children as they grow up and how they, they can and they will change the world. When we see that potential, we'll see why there needs to be so much energy and why there needs to be so much work, why there needs to be such an investment in our children's lives. It matters so very much. 
But then we get to verse 17, and we see the perspective. What is it that Jesus looks at as he holds this child? What is it when Jesus is in the presence of us as we worship that he sees with those mothers and fathers who are sitting beside their children, that those mothers and fathers who are struggling as a family to raise their kids right? What is the perspective of Jesus that is here? Well, the context, if you want to go in that direction here in Luke chapter 18, is this. Go back a little bit earlier to verse 14. Jesus is telling us, those who humble themselves in the Lord's kingdom shall be exalted. But those who exalt themselves shall likewise be humbled. What he's telling us in this passage is we need to have the humility of children. When you look at a young child, you see several things. First and foremost, you see the innocence of a child. <clears throat> we oftentimes talk about how young children are not racist. They may be interested in the different colors of skin and think it's interesting, but racism is taught. It's not a natural occurrence. Children, as they're together, do not recognize at a young age that one child belongs to a one family and another child belongs to perhaps what many people would call a lesser family. They don't see the difference between rich and poor. They don't see the difference of the haves and the have-nots. They don't see the difference in which our society places on so many people and say that some are more important than others. There's an innocence which is there. And what Jesus is saying is that you and I, if we're to be Christians, have to have that same sort of innocence which exists. We see in children a dependence. Children don't wake up in the morning and say, man, I hope my parents take care of me today. Not children in a healthy situation. They know their parents love them. They know their parents will take care of them. They know that they can trust their parents. And in a healthy family situation, that's the case. And God wants us to learn to be dependent upon him. To have that recognition that God is there for you. And whatever it is you face, you are always able to come back and go to him. And to follow him in everything that he does. And, of course, the humility which is there. What we notice as we look at this passage in Luke 18 is the fact that to Jesus, children are not a burden. And sadly, sometimes in the church, that's what we've thought. I've seen some gospel meetings from generations past where a child would cry and that, t that preacher would say, bring that child out of there because this is too important for us to be distracted. That's not the Lord's church. Jesus sees that children are a blessing and not a distraction. I'm proud to be of a congregation, to be a member of a congregation which recognizes that fact. Here in just a little while, we'll begin our preschool. And Stacy and many of our teachers do a great job. I'm looking forward to finally having those children in our hall again and hearing those songs as they march up and down the hallway to the bathroom and to the playground in a socially distanced manner, however you do that with two-year-olds. I'm looking forward to when we go back to school. And we have so many teachers here, administrators here, People who work with the school. And you could find a lot easier jobs. With the education level it takes to be a teacher, you could make a lot more money doing other things. But why do so many of our members become teachers? Because they see the need. They love children and they want children to grow. They want to be around kids and they see the potential of raising the next generation. And so we say to those of our preschool, to those who teach in the public school, God bless you. Thank you for your ministry. Thank you for your work.